Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Joanna Cohn. I'm the director of the Institute for Global Tobacco Control, and I'm really pleased um, to be able to introduce today's speaker, uh, Patricio Marquez. And um, it apparently, he's been retired for a few months, but you couldn't really tell that by all that he's doing um, online all, and all of his activities is talk today. So um, Patricio worked for the World Bank as their lead public health specialist. He worked for the bank for 32 years um, and in 80 countries around the world. Uh, and he was involved, you know, he was seen as a resource and part of leadership teams for a number of public health uh, topics. Uh, he was part of the Ebola emergency response program. He's been, you know, in leadership roles for the avian influenza preparedness uh, program. He was, uh, he served as a public health focal point for the health, nutrition, and population global practice work of the bank. Um, he has authored and worked on areas in global mental health, uh, around non-communicable diseases, around road traffic injuries, and on the economics of antimicrobial resistance. So he has covered a huge range of areas. He also, uh, important to note, has uh, a degree from Hopkins uh, a little while ago, but, um, but he's one of our own. So uh, another area that Patricio is very well known for is for his work in tobacco, and particularly tobacco taxation. He's, again, written many reports. He uh, blogs and tweets about this all the time, and um, today, that's going to be the focus of his, uh, of his presentation to us, focusing on the importance of tobacco taxation, how crucial it is to save lives, and uh, how he sees it as a win-win-win situation. So, Patricio, thank you for being here. I look forward to your presentation. Many thanks. Great. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all yours. Yes. Thanks. Well, I was given specific instructions not to move, so I'm not going to be walking around the room. Uh, colleagues, good afternoon. Um, it certainly, it's good to be back at the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. And I would like to begin by expressing my gratitude to Joanna, to her team, and to Carla for for all the logistical support that she provided, excellent work. So, so having said that, I would like to, to, to get into my presentation. As the title of the presentation, I'm going to try to make the case you, on the basis of evidence that we were able to accumulate across the world that tobacco taxation is a win-win-win policy measure. win with for public health, for domestic resource mobilization, as well as for equity. So, in my presentation, I, I, I have structured it in four broad areas. First of all, Briefly, I will summarize the evidence that justifies the claim that tobacco taxation matter for social and economic development across the world. I will talk a little bit about the drivers of this epidemic and the common claims that in some cases that have become myths that are propagated by the industry and other interest groups to block and hinder the implementation of this policy measure. Unfortunately, colleagues, in many countries, policymakers uncritically accept these claims without any due concern from the evidence that is supposed to back those claims. 
So the evidence that I'm going to present to today to you is to, I would say, try to refute or to indicate that the claims that have come, uh, that in some ways have become myths are not borne out by the available evidence. And then I will conclude with some takeaway messages. The first message that I'm going to, to share with you is that tobacco taxation matters for the accumulation of health capital as well as human capital. And based on recent assessments done by the World Bank, we see that human capital is the key driver for wealth creation in, in, in countries. 60% of wealth that's accumulated in the world is due to this intangible. And since smoking plays a major role in the onset of premature mortality, as well as inequity in mortality, we need to be concerned, not only from a public health point of view, but more importantly, from a broader developmental uh, perspective. And I found this quote, not from a physician, not from an epidemiologist, but from Thomas Schilling. Kevin, probably you know him. Uh, he won the 2000, and, uh, he was awarded the 2005 Nobel Prize in Economics. And he had, he concluded, and I thought that was very apt, that cigarettes are among the most addictive substance of abuse and by far the most de deadly. And certainly all of you probably are aware that if you were to do an assessment What's the, what are the ingredients that are part of a tobacco or of a cigarette, you will discover that they are full of poisons, chemicals, gases, and toxins. And that together they have a major health impact. Nicotine, in particular, is not only highly addictive, but at high levels produces acute toxicity. So you have tar you have carbon monoxide. So de facto, it's a chemical uh, uh, item that if you use regularly, you are going to be negatively impacted. The evidence is clear since the publication of the, in 1964 um, of the Surgeon General Report that established a casualty, a cause and effect relationship between smoking and the incidence of lung cancer and other cancers. In the, uh, the last, in the past 50 years, we have been able to accumulate enough evidence to conclude that smoking cigarettes and using tobacco are associated with the onset of multiple diseases, both non-communicable as well as they aggravate uh, infectious diseases such as tuberculosis. Uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, the 2020 Surgeon General Report that was released a week ago, they have concluded again with additional evidence that Tobacco use leads to many adverse effects, going from reproductive health, negative reproductive health outcomes, cardiovascular diseases, chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary uh, disease, and several cancers. And certainly, colleagues, is tobacco use is the largest preventable disease and that health factor that, according to the st uh, statistics from the World Health Organization, kills about 8 million people on a yearly basis. And 52% of those are in four countries, China, India, the US, and Russia. 
on average, the smokers lose a decade of life. But from all of us who are working on development, this is a major issue because on one hand, the economic performance, the standard of living, the per capita income of countries is changing. They are, those variables are improving and large segments of the population that, that before couldn't afford a pack of cigarettes now are able to use tobacco. So in countries in Africa, in some countries in Asia, you see high prevalence rates that are starting to become very visible, accompanied by an increase in the incidence of tobacco attributable diseases. So from a developer point of view, if you are concerned of if you are trying to promote human capital accumulation as the driver of sustainable economic and social development, you need to pay attention to tobacco use. You need to advocate for the adoption of measures to control and to deter people from using it. I mentioned that we should be concerned not only for on mortality impacts of tobacco <coughs> use, but also in terms of inequality in mortality. All of us have heard, and recently there was a book by another Nobel Prize winner, uh, laureate in economics, Angus Denton from Princeton University, that's, that focuses on the alarming reversal in life expectancy in the United States. And this is in large measure due to the fact that in some income groups, you see a rising premature mortality that's leading to the decrease in life expectancy. And if you see that one of the key factors that's leading to premature mortality among low-income groups, and especially among African-Americans, among Hispanics that, that live below the poverty line, is that they smoke more than high-income groups. So they are dying at a higher rate than high-income groups. So that's where the inequality in mortality occurs. One of the striking messages that came out last week in the 2020 uh, report by the Surgeon General of the United States is this message that contrary to the claims made by the industry and other stake interest groups that promote e-cigarettes as a tool to help small smokers quit, the evidence that's available indicate that many young people are introduced to tobacco through e-cigarettes. Therefore, see, we are talking about instruments that are sold in the marketplace that are delivering nicotine. And as I said before, nicotine is highly addictive and that's the way that the tobacco industry is, uh, is using in order to generate what I will say, the next cohort of smokers. So don't be deceived that e-cigarettes will help you. The evidence is that it actually will increase the risk of people being converted into cigarette smokers. Besides the, the, the public health impacts, I will say the, uh, the, the human high toll, there, is, there are economic effects. And that also adds to the importance of focusing on tobacco use and mechanisms to control it, mainly because it affects 
economic performance uh, of countries through two mechanisms. First of all, there is the direct economic impact that's associated with healthcare expenditure. Somebody has to pay them. And in some countries where you don't have universal health coverage, it's out-of-pocket payments that are required if you want to get medical care or get the necessary medications if you want to save your lives. So in the case of the United States, again, from studies done by the CDC, it shows that about 10% of annual healthcare spending can be attributed to cigarette, uh, to cigarette smoking. And when we convert that relative figure into an absolute figure, we see that tobacco use actually is consuming $170 billion per year. That's a huge amount that could have alternative uses, especially to improve the conditions among low-income populations. And across the world, if you compare the direct impacts associated with healthcare expenditures that are due to the need to treat tobacco-related illnesses, and then the indirect effects. The indirect effects are those that are related, let's say, to being absent from work when you get sick. And if you are uh, absent, then productivity, your individual productivity, the, indiv the productivity of a firm or of an enterprise also goes down. And that has a cost for society. So studies done by colleagues from the World Health Organization show that the economic loss combine direct and indirect impacts amount to 1.4 trillion US dollars. So besides public health colleagues, there is a, a major, I will say a significant economic impact that tends to undermine the economic development of countries. The second message is that the economics of manipulation and deception, or the uh, economics of deception and that manipulation drag, uh, drive tobacco use, along with policies adopted by governments to support production of cigarettes and to promote trade across the world. And I'm going to explain. In a book by two Nobel laureates in economics, George Akerlof and Robert Schiller, Fishing for Fools is a wonderful book that makes the case that in the market, that while um, uh, market economies tend to be the most efficient for allocating resources, also offer the opportunity to profit from unsuspected people. And the way that people who don't have any scruples try to sell products that will have a negative impact on people is by crafting stories, stories that shape the behavior of people, and by shaping the behavior leads you to consume the goods and services that they are trying to promote in order to generate a profit. You have seen this, smoking is glamorous. That's a nice, nice story. Everybody wants to be beautiful. Smoking makes you feel good. Everybody wants to be a Marlboro man. And in order to deceive and manipulate, you have advertisement. All of you probably are familiar with a wonderful TV series called Mad Men that uh, played a couple, uh, a couple years ago. There is a substantial amount of resources that the tobacco industry spends in promoting these goods. Nine billion dollars just in the United States. And they target a specific population groups, vulnerable populations, the youth, the, the young, the young adults. We have seen with these cigarettes used in social media, women, and certainly, let's say, with menthol the targets are 
African Americans, Hispanic population. So they target specifically in order to craft, to convey in a story and in a story that will modify behavior and induce people to demand and consume that good. But besides the economics of deception and manipulation in the form of advertising and marketing, I recently came out a, a wonderful book last year called The Cigarette. And if it's a history of the political economic of tobacco cultivation, production, and commercialization in the, in the 20th century. And it shows that governments, in this case the federal government in the United States, play a key role in promoting tobacco use globally. Soldiers were given a ration that helped popularize the consumption. We have seen that in movies. Surplus export programs boosted farmers' income and global cigarette uh, consumption. And there were price subsidies that helped stabilize the agricultural economy in the Southeast. Yes, you have very powerful senators in some of the committees that were pushing this agenda for political purposes. And this agenda helped advance the, the epidemic across the world. And I will say that there is a, in spite of the fact that the Surgeon General Report was published in 1964, the first one, uh, showing the cause and effect relationship between smoking and, <laughs> and, and lung cancer, the industry continued to exploit the scientific uncertainty. Hopkins is an empirical paradise. <laughs> so what they, the industry did, and certainly I remember during my times here, is that they created doubt about the claims. And I remember very much you know, in the 80s when I was a student, that there was the claim by the industry saying that there was no cause and effect relationship. It was only a statistical association. So all of you who have taken biostatistics will understand that by doing that, by claiming that there were simple bio, uh, statistical uh, associations, then that created doubts about the body of fact that existed right after the publication of the 1964 uh, report. And on the basis of all these factors, the industry has been the most powerful, uh, the most profitable industry in the world for the last hundred years. And I'm saying this not because I want to, to criticize the industry, but actually, this information that you have in this slide comes from Swiss Bank. Swiss Bank, a leading uh, uh, actor in Wall Street, does a yearly assessment on the performance of different industries, and they were comparing which industries were the most profitable on the basis of rates of return. By far, the tobacco industry was the most profitable. Why? Mechanization helped reduce the cost of production vis-a-vis -vis the retail price. Second, by promoting the, the use of nicotine, you have a captive population. So if you, if you put them together, you have a tremendous source of profit. As the uh, Swiss, uh, Credit Suisse report show, the profit rate was 165 times greater than the average industry. Addiction and low cost of production led to gigantic profit margins. And you, we have to be very conscious that we are dealing with a very powerful, very savvy industry that as part of their business plans, they are able to, to 
diversified markets and segment markets. While in the high income countries right now, the big push is for e-cigarettes. In the rest of the world, in low and low middle income countries, the push is for cigarettes. So by if you are losing revenue in high income countries because people are no longer smoking cigarettes, you compensate by promoting cigarettes in the rest of the world. We are talking about global enterprises. So we need to keep that in mind. The third message related to taxation is that price plays an important role in smoking. Again, this is a, a slide that was, uh, that was prepared for a presentation by Jason Furman, who was the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors during the, uh, the Obama administration. I invited him to make a presentation and he said the most, uh, but the most important public health measure that the Obama administration ended up adopting was not the Affordable Care Act, was the increase in, in the federal tax on cigarettes that went from 32 cents to 1.2 US dollars. And this graph clearly shows that when prices go up, consumption goes down. So that relationship that we are observing in four months slide is also observed in Mexico. And it's, it's observed everywhere. When prices are low, people smoke more. You increase prices, then consumption goes down. So price is a major deterrent. And that has to be seen as the key underpinning element of any tobacco tax reform proposal. The goal is not just to increase taxes. The goal is to increase taxes so that prices can go up. The fourth message that I would like to share with you is that cigarette taxes play an important role in cigarette prices. And as I said before, there are, from an economic point of view, one could put forward several arguments to justify why state intervention is required in order to, to alter the supply and uh, the demand and supply uh, variables in the marketplace. But the first and most important is excise taxation. It's a powerful, it's a cost-effective policy that, that, that has shown that if you increase prices, then that will become a barrier for tobacco use and people will start smoking less, those who have already become addicted, but more importantly, they become a barrier for the young people because they have to think twice, either I'm going to have a hamburger or I'm going to buy a pack of Marlboro. So there are trade-offs. And certainly that's why one of the uh, uh, taxation is something that the e-cigarette companies are afraid of. But taxation of cigarettes is not something new. In the landmark study, uh, by the father of modern economics, Adam Smith, he already talked in the late 1700s that sugar, rum, and tobacco are commodities we are, which are nowhere necessities, necess necessaries of life, which are objects of almost universal consumption, and which are therefore extremely proper subjects of taxation. And this is Adam Smith in the late 1700s. So the rationale for focusing on taxation is, is uh, from a theoretical point of view, as shown in this slide, is that if you increase prices by 10%, you are going to alter the demand patterns. And certainly in economics you call the elasticities, is how responsive demand is to an increase of prices. And that bad varies by country, 
but also among social economic groups. So since we are dealing with an intermediate variable called nicotine, that's highly addictive, the, so you don't have a one-to-one -one relationship because people who are addicted is, have fi uh, find a very hard time uh, decreasing or quitting smoking. So the relationship, for, for example, in high-income countries is that for each dollar that you, uh, that you increase, I will say you will expect that a 4% four, a four decrease. In low-income countries, given the, uh, the price structure as well as the income structure, the responsiveness tend to be uh, higher. So this graph shows the, the prepare, uh, modify, uh, that was prepared by a colleague from the bank for a case study that she did in Armenia and later on was modified and adapted by a colleague uh, uh, also at the bank, uh, Alan Fuchs, shows the impact of excise taxes and increasing taxes and increasing prices, how that decreases the affordability of the product that affects consumption decisions all the way to the positive or negative impacts. So this kind of a uh, but uh, I would say is a value chain type of uh, figure uh, that helps explain how this policy measure plays uh, in, the, in the marketplace once it's introduced. And as I was saying before, again, this is Furman, cigarette taxes play an important role in cigarette prices. So you increase taxes, you increase prices. And as we saw before, by increasing prices, you reduce demand and use. And one of the things that, uh, and I will cover later on, that is a major claim by the industry is that if you increase taxes, you increase prices, reduce demand, you put at risk the tax the viability of the tax base of your country. But we are going to see that later on, that, that that's not the case. But the relationship between taxes and prices is again something that's observed in the United States and everywhere in the, uh, in the world. This is um, this figure uh, uh, is from, uh, I forgot uh, to put the uh, the, 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 the name of the country, and this is from Russia, that adopted tax increases back in 2010 with substantial increase in 2013, and now they are increasing again. And in the case of Russia, it was important to tax both cigarettes as well as alcohol in order to reverse the demographic decline. Russia was experiencing a major shrinking of their population, especially among adult males. When I was working there in the, early, in the first decade of the century, life expectancy above males have lowered to 58 years. Now, as a result of these measures and other measures, they have, they have started climbing again to 66, but still below the European Union averages. But tobacco plays a major role it was playing, along with alcohol abuse, was playing a major role in the demographic decline. So in Russia, as you can see, the increase in prices and uh, taxes led to increase in prices, and then use started to come down. And from a middle-income country such as Colombia that adopted a major reform as part of the fiscal consolidation package in 2016-17, you could see, again, a major jump. Taxes were increased for cigarettes, prices went up. The case of China after the 2015 reform is also illustrative about this, uh, this relationship between taxes and prices. And this is from the, uh, from the European Union. You increase taxes, you increase prices, and then you could see how the consumption starts to go down. 
Korea is another example, especially right, right after the 2014-15 policy, uh, tax policy increases. South Africa. So the message, colleagues, is that regardless of the level of income of a country, taxes lead to higher prices, prices lead to a decrease in demand and, and, and utilization. So you could see that it's a very powerful measure to curb the consumption of this good that has all kinds of negative externalities, not only for the smokers, but the so-called second-hand smoking that affects family, especially children in a household, if you have a father who smokes, as well a third, uh, a third, um, uh, a third hand uh, a negative impact because the different chemicals tend to accumulate in rocks and in other uh, parts of the household, creating a risk that's not visible. Message five, cigarettes, uh, cigarette taxes by increasing prices and lowering consumption have large aggregate benefits for public health. And on this one, I would like to, uh, to clearly uh, state that the main objective in advocating for the adoption of this public health, uh, of, this, of this fiscal measure is to generate public health gains. And only as an externality, as a secondary effect, then you are able to mobilize additional revenue as well as, as to, uh, that could be used in order to enlarge the fiscal space that you have in country to finance priority programs and investments. As we can see, in, in the UK has one of the large tax rates in the world. Prices are very high, above $10 on average. And you can see that over the last couple I will say, the, the, I will say the, over the last 30, 40 years, you have a, a sustained decrease in consumption. But in parallel, but behind the sustained increase is that you have here a sustained uh, uh, increase in taxes. And this is another critical element to keep in mind because as the population gets richer, as per capita income grows, people will have more disposable income to purchase cigarettes. So if you don't adjust prices in accordance to inflation, as well as the per capita income changes, then you will not generate this, the, this, uh, this positive effect. So the British government has continued to increase taxes. Therefore, prices have continued to go up. And then you have this decreasing trajectory that has been maintained. Same relationship is uh, observed in the case of uh, the Republic of Korea, especially after the 2015 increase. And that this is an important figure, mainly because it shows that it has become a deterrent for young people to start smoking. Therefore, you are preventing addiction to take a hold. People after 21 years of age rarely take the habit. So youth need to be protected. And that's why the big argument about e-cigarette is because they are targeting using social media your, the young cohort, because eventually they may become the next cohort of cigarette smokers. And there are different variables that show the wins for public health. Measure in terms of reduction in the prevalence of smokers, the Global Ad uh, Adult Tobacco Survey in the Philippines shows how the uh, this, uh, the current uh, cigarette, uh, 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 the prevalence rate of smokers is, is going down. Ukraine, again, 
we can see a gradual decrease in the smoking in Ukraine that's associated with, I will say, a sustained increase in taxes over the past decade, especially among the population groups 18 to 30. We see from the United States that there are several changes in smoking behavior due to the 2009 tax increase, the first law that was signed by President Obama from reduction in smoking initiation, past month smoking, days of smoking, 30 years, cigars per day, cigar uh, per day uh, among non-daily smokers. And work that we did in Ukraine simulating the likely gains in terms of good health outcomes, we show that by reducing the risk of developing several chronic diseases, particular cardiovascular diseases, then you could avoid premature mortality, you could avoid uh, absentees in the workplace, and also you could forego healthcare expenditures that are needed to treat these, uh, these, uh, these costly diseases. And those resources can have alternative uses not only in order to improve, let's say, in the case of Ukraine, when I was working there, there was a major epidemic of, of uh, the, a major outbreak of missiles, mainly because the country was not putting enough resources to finance the, the missiles vaccine. So if they, instead of using that money to treat costly tobacco attributable diseases, the government were to use that money to, to make sure that the immunization program is fully funded, then uh, the story will be different. But also, from a public health perspective, the additional resources could be used in order to improve housing, to improve road safety. Therefore, you can leverage in investments in other sectors in order to generate the public health gains that are expected from a public policy. Uh, also, with a colleague, Prabhajad, we did some work in Vietnam last year. And again, we simulated a 32% increase in cigarette prices and what kind of health gains you, the population in Vietnam could get. And certainly, we saw that, for example, uh, people could gain immediately almost three years of life years among males in the low-income quantiles. Again, this shows that even if you are a smoker, if you quit smoking, you will gain years of life. If you quit when you are 30, uh, 35, 44, you stand to gain nine years of life. And this is from a piece that was uh, uh, prepared, an assessment done by Prabhajat, as well as Richard Pito, who is one of the leading uh, epidemiologists on tobacco uh, in the world. Message six, colleagues, I mentioned this before. While generating the public health benefits, governments stand to gain from a fiscal point of view. Increasing taxes also help to mobilize additional tax revenue that could be used in order to finance priority investments and programs across sectors. Therefore, it has a, a net impact on improving social welfare. But this has been a common argument by the industry. Again, they, are, uh, they go to ministries of finance and say, listen, if you increase taxes, people are going to, uh, to stop smoking. Therefore, you are not going to be collecting enough money that you need in order to shore up your budget. But the evidence is completely contrary to those claims. Even our colleagues from the International Monetary uh, Fund, we were able to establish a good rapport after they admitted that in many countries, raising tobacco taxes can offer a win-win, higher, higher revenue and positive health outcomes. And this from the macroeconomists from the International Monetary Fund. And they also noted in that report that current tax rates are evidently far below what's feasible in terms of revenue potential. And if you try to maximize health gains, therefore you can increase your taxes even higher. 
So this is from the International Monetary Fund. And uh, when it was published at the end of 2016, it gave us a lot of cover because ministers of finance and people working at the ministries of finance who make these kind of decisions, they tend to listen to the IMF. So, uh, so we were, that was a win, an institutional win for us. The, 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 we were advocating uh, for the IMF to change positions. And again, the evidence is very clear that increasing taxes, raising prices, lowering consumption does not lead to an apocalyptic scenario in which governments st stop collecting uh, tobacco tax revenue. Quite the contrary. This is from the EU. As you can see, over the years from 2008 to 2016, taxes went up, prices went up, consumption decreased, as, as I show in the previous graph, and revenue went up. So something is, is wrong from that, uh, from that claim. That's in the, in the uh, higher uh, income countries that are part of the European Union. Look, the same relationship is observed in South Africa, in Korea, in Turkey. Consumption went down, revenue continued to increase. Because prices are up, you're taxing, you're taxing a product at a higher price uh, level. Then you have the, the situation associated with addiction that influence also how, how fast you quit. And people are going to continue to use. Perhaps they will smoke less, those who are already addicted. And the, uh, this is uh, uh, the, from the experience of the Ukraine. It's very clear to sh uh, that shows how prices went up as a result of the sustained increase in taxes. And revenue continued to increase. And in the case of Ukraine, this was important because they had a major budgetary problem in 2017. So this additional revenue helped address that big budget hole that Ukraine uh, was facing, especially in the midst of the military conflict with Russia. The, perhaps the, one of the best examples in the world about this win-win-win relationship is Philippines, uh, in the sense that with the adoption of the sin tax law in 2012, revenue has continued to increase, consumption is falling, and most importantly, as uh, on the basis of the law that was approved by the Filipino Congress, 80% of the additional revenue that's collected by taxing at a higher rate cigarettes as well as alcohol is used to expand universal health coverage. In this case, to subsidize the, premium, the health insurance premiums of low income population. So right now, the Philippines has been able to to increase the share of the population that has uh, health insurance by uh, to a level that's about half of the total population over the last five, six years. And in large measure, uh, is due to the fact that there was a subsidy and the subsidy was financed using uh, tobacco and alcohol taxes. Mes message seven. Tobacco taxes disproportionately benefit low-income household. Therefore, it's a progressive measure. For politicians, this is an important argument. Usually, people have been, uh, 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 politicians believe that if you increase prices, you are going to affect the poor more because the poor will continue to be addicted then in order to continue to smoke, they will need to, to spend a relative larger share of their household income in order to continue to smoke. Therefore, by increasing a larger share that will affect their budget, they, have, they, they will affect the consumption of basic goods, for example, milk for the children or books for 
the, uh, that are needed uh, uh, in, in school. But there are several elements that one needs to consider. First of all, smoking is more prevalent at lower income, uh, lower income groups. So as we are going to see by the evidence, reductions in smoking are larger for poor since they tend to be more sensitive to prices. So if a good goes up, the price of a good goes up, people at the lower income level, since they have limited means, they will think twice whether to consume that or to use the available resources to finance other priority items in the household. Second, one has to, uh, to assume that the dollar value of health benefits don't vary with incomes. So proportional is more important for lower households if they reduce consumption. And third, as in the case of the Philippines, it's not only to measure how equitable or progressive this measure is not only uh, good to see who is more responsive to the increase in prices, what kind of benefits those individuals are able to derive, but also how that additional money is being used for. In the case of the Philippines, it's been used as part of the budget process to subsidize health insurance for the poor. In the case of the tobacco tax measure that was adopted, tobacco tax increase that was adopted in Colombia as part of the fiscal consolidation process of 2017, it's mandated that those resources coming from an increase in tobacco taxes and cigarette uh, and alcohol taxes are, are to be used by the subnational level to increase the affiliation of low-income people to the national health insurance uh, scheme. So this is a critical element to consider because how you use the money how you target that money, that additional revenue, to generate benefits across the population also makes this policy highly progressive. And uh, on the basis of work that was, uh, that was led by my colleague Alan Fuchs, uh, working with, with us as part of the team, we were able to accumulate evidence from different countries from Chile all the way to Indonesia, Ukraine, Moldova, Vietnam, that shows the progressivity of this measure. In the case of, of Chile, 2011, this is very clearly uh, 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 explained that, yes, you could say that uh, increasing prices is a burden for the poor, because if they want to continue to smoke, they will have to spend more. So in that sense, it's regressive. But that's only the cause. And when people say, oh, it's highly regressive, they fail to take into account the benefits. The benefits are associated with the reduction of health risks, reduction of healthcare expenditure, especially in countries where you, have, uh, you don't have universal health coverage and the risk of catastrophic healthcare expenditures as well and poverty is quite high as well as the indirect effects that are associated with increased productivity and longer, uh, uh, longer lifespans that allow you to generate more income for your families. That's in the case of Chile. The same type of relationship is observed in the case of Ukraine. As you can see, the, the benefits in, from a net, net point of view tend to be more, uh, to, tend to accru uh, accrue more among the uh, in low income groups, you know, decile one and decile two uh, of the population vis-a-vis -vis the, the rich because they can also, they, they have the capacity to continue to enjoy their cigarettes by spending more, spend more mainly because they have the purchasing power ability. And again, this, this graph shows how on one, the benefits, the net benefits accrue in large measure to low income groups vis-a-vis -vis the, the high income quantiles. Uh, again, we can see the, how the, the use of the money makes this a, a progressive measure. This is from the Philippines. 
And you can see after the 2012 reform how the additional money going to finance the, soft, uh, the, the premiums went up. The same thing we can see on the adoption of the 2009 ref tax, uh, federal tax, uh, uh, tobacco tax increase during the, at the beginning of the Obama administration. And the, the argument was very clear. We need to continue to maintain and expand the health insurance for the poor program, CHIPS, CHIP. So we need, according to, to, to Congress, you need to identify a source of revenue. So the source of revenue was this. Let's increase the federal tax. And uh, that has allowed poor children to have access to needed services. As you can see, the you know, lowest, uh, again, in the case of the United States, based on the uh, Council of Economic Affairs calculations, the low-income groups, low, lowest quantile and second quantile, tend to derive the most benefit in terms of health and the benefit of being covered by CHIP. Makes us age. High taxes, are. Uh, the, uh, it is common to, to, to hear from the industry to say, okay, if you increase prices, especially in, in low and middle income countries, they are going to be subject to an influx of illegal cigarettes due to uh, counterfeit cigarettes, smuggled cigarettes. Uh, so the argument that we are making, again, based on the evidence that hot taxes are not the primary reason for cigarette smuggling and cigarette tax, tax avoidance. And this is clearly observed. Countries that have very high taxes, high prices, have low, uh, uh, have low percentage of illicit uh, tobacco in their markets, while countries that have very low taxes, low prices, tend to, to have the highest uh, in, 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 in concentration of uh, uh, smuggling uh, tobacco uh, products. So, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm going to be wrapping up. So you know, you yes, an important yes. Part of it, so uh, uh, let me tell you this: uh, the, uh, in this assessment that we did in 30 countries across the world, uh, different income levels, we show that the key, uh, the key, uh, the key factors associated with smuggling and illicit trade of tobacco products are not high prices. The problem is lack of uh, legal framework, lack of regulations, lack of enforcement capacity, uh, particularly among people working in, in the custom systems, and corruption. There, uh, so, uh, recently I saw a graph that the index of corruption related to level of smuggling. It's very clear to show higher corruption, higher smuggling. So there are different uh, uh, measures, a strong legal framework, specialized excise administration and enforcement, all these services um, uh, that help uh, to, uh, to, to deal with this problem. There are examples from Canada. There is the example uh, from Indonesia. And certainly there is a very good case, a good example from Ireland, uh, the UK as well, and Turkey. If the final message, colleagues, for you is that one or another key argument that sways ministers of finance and politicians is that increasing taxes and prices by, will lead to the reduction on consumption and that will negatively impact employment in the tobacco industry. We did several studies in, in Indonesia uh, over this 2018-2019 period, and we show that to begin with, due to mechanization, the share of employment in the tobacco industry is minimal compared to other sectors, such as uh, in, uh, manufacturer workers. Women tend to be exploited, they are at risk of green diseases. The, almost half of the workers are poor. And we did some simulations that show that in spite of the increases, less than, 
0.5% losses in tobacco uh, industry will occur if that was to happen. We are talking about for a country as big as Indonesia with a large population of more than 100 million, uh, uh, losses will account between uh, 300, 400 uh, jobs. And they will happen anyway because of mechanization. Uh, so key lessons for tobacco taxes, if you are going to advise governments, you have to advise to go, bi go big, higher taxes, and go fast in order to deal with the political opposition. Taxes are matter only if they modify prices and reduce the affordability of the product. You have to have communication strategy to change expectations by informing the population that this is not a one-time shot, but this is part of a policy that will be adjusted by inflation, by per capita income growth, tax by quantity, focus on, on your tax structure, focus on using specific uh, taxes rather than ad valorem, continue to adjust them according to income changes to uh, inflation. So for your marking, as we saw in the Philippines, Colombia can help navigate the political process. If you go to the public and say, listen, I'm going to increase your taxes mainly because we are going to have a national health insurance program for all, that helps. Regional cooperation helps, especially with illicit trade. And the final uh, element, need to build broad alliances with politicians, with members of Congress, with civil society, with those people who have been damaged or affected negatively by tobacco use. So stop smoking is deadly and bad for the economy. Many thanks. <laughs>